time goes so fast on this time frame that we have. We have been talking, this is the third week, on living fear-free in a fear-filled environment. And if I could remember, I want to remind you, that we have been talking about, we, we, we are trying to sensitize you to the fact, as long as you're upon this earth, you are going to be faced with fearsome and fearful realities. No one of us is exempt or immune. And we showed where the Bible, before even the time of Christ, that God actually, in each of the men whom he used, and in the nation of Israel, his oft admonition to them was, fear not, don't be afraid, and things like that. And our base text is really Isaiah 41 verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And we said that even after Calvary, in the time of grace, the Bible still is very explicit that we are going to be surrounded by an environment of fear. And Jesus was very, very careful to emphasize to disciples they ought not to be afraid. We saw whereby there'll be fearful events in your journey of life or journey for life or journey to life. We saw whereby there will be uh, fearful elements as far as your material needs are concerned. There will be actually fearful elements as far as your societal needs are concerned and concern over future world developments. And I just mentioned that last week. I don't think I had enough time to really emphasize it. So I want to start off this morning with that. The fourth thing that we are going to face as far as environmental realities are concerned. And I use those terms because I want us to know that these are not just simply fictitious things we're talking about. These are down-to-earth things that are going to be real as you live your life from day to day, irrespective of your geographical location or your social status. And tonight, today, we are talking about the development of world events. In the book of Luke, Gospel chapter 21, and verse 26, the Lord was talking about the end time. And maybe I should read from verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now you went to observe some very positive statement in those two verses. And one of those things is, there are going to be perplexities coming upon the face of the earth. And today we are facing some of them, not all, but some of them. We have seen nations rise against nations, we have seen kingdoms rise and fall as we have done the times of the Gentiles, the great Gentile world powers that dominated the world. There are no more. But let us confine our thought to today, the time in which you and I are living. And you're going to observe that nothing that Jesus said or nothing that the Bible says is irrelevant. First of all, we are talking about world developments. Let me just simply refresh your memory. Look at China, for example. China, after the inauguration of the present American president, China 
observe that there is an element of gross weakness in the Biden administration and they are taking advantage of the whole thing. Don't you forget that China's ambition is to become the number one power upon the face of the earth. Economically and militarily, that is their ambition. But at the end of this segment, I'm going to let you know that that will never, ever happen according to scripture. And I'll prove it to you. Now, what have they done? Before this administration came into being, China knew quite well because they were warned that if you ever make any uncalled for move toward Taiwan, you are going to come up against us. I mean America, because we are committed and we are sworn of faithfulness and our support to Taiwan. Now, since Mr. Biden has become the president and they have seen the weakness, as many as 1,800 flights by the Chinese fighter jets have flown over Taiwan. The carriers, aircraft carriers, have actually gone into the strait as a means of provocation. And we are told that one of the planes, or many of the planes rather, that they have flown over Taiwan as a mark of intimidation, they have the capability of carrying nuclear warheads. And therefore, China is making quite clear that they are prepared to invade Taiwan at any time. Will Mr. Biden go to their rescue like other presidents in the past have actually indicated they will? And this is what is happening, beloved. And the world is looking on. China also, on the 20th of this month, that's about five days ago, four days ago, they actually tested a supersonic missile which can carry a nuclear warhead. A supersonic missile travels three times the speed of sound. It means, therefore, a missile like that is very hard to intercept, it's very hard to actually destroy. And that is what China has done, and they have taken the world by surprise, and they make it no secret that their plan is for world domination. In their mind, the only power that was standing in their way is the United States of America. But now they are seeing the weakness. They are coming out in boldness and they are actually unmuffling their threat to Taiwan. We go to the Middle East, for example, and Iran one of the top nuclear scientists in the world today, I won't call his name on this program, got to be very careful, he has actually indicated that if Iran really wants to do it, they have the capability to develop a nuclear warhead within three weeks. Now, beloved, why does Iran want a nuclear bomb? For one reason, they have made it quite clear that their intention is to wipe Israel off from the map. That is their intention. Get Israel off the map. And do you think that if they get a bomb, they will not do it? They will. That is their plan. And so we are facing the possibility of open nuclear war in the Middle East. Let me just simply jump the gun here and bring in this path I have for you. Now, Israel is not sleeping. Israel is not lying down. Israel has sworn without any intimidation without any cover-up 
that they will not allow Iran to get a nuclear bomb. And they are making it quite clear that if the world does not stop them, we are prepared to do it ourselves. That is what they have declared. Last week, the foreign minister of Israel was in Washington, and he made quite clear, quite clear to Mr. Biden, that if you don't decide to help us, we will go it alone, but we are bent in our determination that Iran will not be allowed to declare or to own or to develop a nuclear device. So just four days ago, Israel had declared to the world their budget. And the American quite clear that $1.5 billion is allocated for the one specific reason to stop Iran from developing a nuclear bomb. Immediately, we are not trying to put water in our mouth that we're prepared to attack Iran if we have to, but not as long as we exist, will Iran be allowed to develop a nuclear weapon? Now, do you think, beloved, if Israel attacks Iran, that Russia wouldn't come to help them, that China wouldn't help them, that Hezbollah and Hamas wouldn't help them? Because Iran has taken these nations as their satellite. And they are ex the biggest importers, ex sorry, exporters rather, of terrorism across the Middle East. And that's why in the time of Mr. Trump, when he had the Abraham Accord, where five Arab nations got together and made peace with Israel, with America being like the chairperson, because they're prepared to band together to stop Iran. And now that Mr. Biden is thinking about the weakness of the day, and even Israel is not quite sure if they can depend upon Mr. Biden to help them in the event that they are attacked by Iran and by Hezbollah and by Hamas. Now we got to, we're looking here at world development. We have, for example, the terror groups like Hezbollah. They have been Boston and bragging just this week, also to this past week, that they have 100,000 well-trained soldiers and they will have no hesitation in using them against whom? Israel. They have declared that they have 150,000 missiles and just 14 days ago, they pump as many as 2,000 missiles into Israel and they declare they will do it again. Hezbollah right now is occupying one third of Lebanon. They have put themselves there as a state within the state. And just a week ago, there was a tremendous demonstration in the street of Lebanon because a judge had been brave enough to demand that he went to investigate them when they had this tremendous explosion and so many people were killed and they were marching and demanding that the judge be fired and I think about 13 people were killed in the violence. It is believed that Lebanon is so distressed both economically, politically and militarily that it can be destroyed anytime as far as the raging terror of Hezbollah is concerned. We have Hamas also, and they are capable, they say, of launching 200,000 missiles per day into Israel. That is uh, what they are both believing. That is uh, what the enemies of Israel are saying. And they are not making jokes. They are prepared to do because in their mind, Israel must be wiped off the map. In their mind, human life does not matter. In their mind, they look at human life as bad weeds that need to be pulled up and destroyed. And what I'm saying that I'm trying to bring you up to date with the fact 
that they are really world development that can rain terror in your heart, that can make you forget, beloved, who you really are. And these are real things. These are not what somebody has concocted in their imagination. They are real. And we have North Korea, for example. Again, looking at the weakness of Mr. Biden, they have actually tested a very powerful inter-ballistic, intercontinental ballistic missile. And they have actually provoked Japan by going into the Strait of Japan with their, with their boats. I mean, the world is looking on. And the world is prepared to do anything. And if anybody thought that we could have had an administration weaker than the Carter administration, they realized now that they were wrong. Mr. Carter was weak, but this man, I find the word weak is too gentle a word to use for him. But we as the people of God understand that the Bible warns us that such things will develop upon the face of the earth. Again, Luke chapter 21 and verse 26, the Lord may quite clear, it's upon the face of the earth that these things will take place. And then COVID, millions have died. And when you think there is a recession of the thing, there is an outbreak again of something of a different nature. And we ask ourselves, where and when is this COVID scourge going to end? Many people are fearful of their lives. Economies have been shattered. Governments have been brought under great strain and stress and to a point of even collapsing because they don't know when and where and how to bring this thing to an end. Beloved, these are perilous times and the Bible said that these things that form one of the reasons why we will have an environmental situation where if you don't understand who you are, fear will dominate your life. Now, in the light of all of this, I think it is very, it is very pertinent to ask yourself, is it really unrealistic for the Bible to be asking us not to be afraid. I've just mentioned a few things that are taking place now. In the light of all that, you may say, well, it is unreasonable. How can the Bible expect us not to be afraid? How can God expect that of us? Yes, beloved, it is reasonable. You know why? Because God has made it quite clear that the people who are called by his name can live in this type of environment and not be dominated by fear because he has given us the resources and he has given us also the principles whereby we who believe in God can live our lives free from fear. So that now brings me to the final point of the series. How can we live without fear? Now the point is this. If it were not possible to live without fear in a fearful world, the Bible would not have exhorted us to do so. And I want you to listen to me very, very carefully, beloved. And sort the scriptures I will give one to you. And I repeat that statement I made a while ago. If it were not possible to live without fear in a fear-filled world, the word of God would not have admonished us to do so, to live without fear. Fear not, be not afraid. And hear me, here are four or five points I want to deal with. How can we overcome fear? First of all, there must be a deep realization that God is with us. If I could simplify that, realize his presence 
with you. And we come to our text now. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Let's stop there. <laughs> the opening statement, fear thou not. Why? Not because you have known some scripture, or because you are learned, or because you are professional, or because you are a prophet, or an apostle. He said, no, you must not be afraid. You know why? Because number one, I am with you. And beloved, the people of God must understand that this is scripturally sung, that God is with his people. Take out your Bible. This is what God expects, and this is God's reputation, that he is with the people. First of all, to Moses, in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 14, he said, Moses, my presence will go with thee, and I will give you rest. My presence will go with thee. Exodus 33 and verse 14. To Joshua, he told him in chapter 1 and verse 5, As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. He told the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 20 and verse 3 and 4, we did last week. He said to them, I will be with you and will bless you. To Isaac, when Isaac was afraid in the time of famine, in Genesis chapter 26, he said, Isaac, fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee. And of course, our text, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Jesus, after he rose from the dead, and even before he died and went to Calvary, his last day, his last 24 hours with those guys was here, fear not. Don't let your heart be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Fear not. All these are scriptures, son, that God is saying, you can live with all the gloom around you, all the enemies around you, all the negative forces against you and around you, and you can live a life that is fear free. We come to a guy called David. Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. If there were a man in the Bible who was surrounded by evil conditionalities and evil tidings, whose life was daily jeopardized, not by a street dweller, not by an insignificant person, but a king and his whole army, King Saul. And David wrote, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, David was not saying if he come to a point where he's dying, the valley of the shadow of death was a real geographical, physical place where walking there was so dangerous and so treacherous that you never had a guarantee that once you entered, you'll come out alive. It was hostile, it was dangerous, and you will have to be a person wanting to commit suicide to traverse the valley of the shadow of death. It was so dangerous, that is what it was called, the shadow of death in that valley. And David said, even though I were to be there, I'm not going to be afraid. Why? Why will he not be afraid? Is it because he was so strong, he could destroy a bear and the lion with his bare hand? Or was it because he was so very, 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 expertise in his activity with his swing, his sling, that he could have killed Goliath? Or was it the tremendous military training that he had that he could actually take some feeble men and destroy a whole army of the Syrians and the Ammonites? No, it was not that. He said, the reason why I will not be afraid is because God, you are with me. 
And once you know, beloved, that God is with you, that is enough to dispel every fear. Because none of us is immune to fear. Fear can strike you in an unguarded moment. I know why the Bible says, fear not, because it's something we got to live with. But the fear has not got to dominate you. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. So first of all, how do I overcome fear? I must keep in my heart the consciousness that God is with me. Now, let me give you maybe a little personal testimony. One of them Bible school, for example. I have something I could choose from, but I want a short one. I was told that the Maracas Valley where the Bible school was, or is, was very dangerous. For it was known that students were actually stopped and robbed. Some were beaten before I got there, of course. And they said, never walk that valley alone. And one night I went to preach in San Grande Grande and I came back very late to the Curate Junction where the taxi stand was. And there was no taxi on the stand. So I had to walk from Curate Junction right up into number four bridge in Maracas Valley. It was dark, it was lonely, and it was about half past midnight. And I'm walking. And I remembered what I was told. And as, as, as I reached at the number three bridge in Miracles Valley, I heard like a whistle blow. Somebody blew a whistle. And I heard like the bushes up on the hill above me began to rustle. And I feel that my head began to just simply swell on my shoulder. My, my head began to become numb with fear. And I remembered Isaiah 41, 10, that changed my life back in St. Vincent. I'll explain to you sometime later on. And it was Isaiah 41, 10, and I heard the word spoken, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. My life was transformed, and that night in Miracles Valley, the fear went. I felt as if the moon came out. There was no moon, but I felt as if the moon came out. And I walk up in that valley and got to number four, but at half quarter to one in the morning with no fear. Fear was gone. Now fear came. But I recognized that this was not God. It was contrary. And the Lord by the Holy Ghost reminded me that I was not walking alone in the valley. But he was with me. And if the Lord is with me, I have no fear. You know what? To attack me, you got to get past him. And beloved, you'll have a hard time getting past my God who leads me in the paths of righteousness. Secondly, how do I get fear out of my life? Secondly, recognize that he is God. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Now, that is powerful. If you look at the Hebrew, the word God is in capital letters. And when it is translated, it is either translated Elohim, which means God, El Shaddai, the being the self-sufficient one, or Jehovah. He said, don't be afraid because I am Jehovah, the mighty one, the powerful one. And in the book of Genesis chapter 17, when the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, Abraham, I am the almighty God. Hallelujah. Walk before me and be thou perfect. In the same word he used, in Isaiah 41, 10, I am God, I am Jehovah, I am Elohim, I am El Shaddai. The most powerful name for God is the word that was used there when God said, I am God. What God wants us to know, beloved, 
The while we are surrounded by fear, we have a stronger one, the mighty God, the creator of heaven and earth. No power can stand against him. No power can overcome him. No power can resist him. The Bible declared that he is the one who causes everything be brought into subjection unto himself. I said, don't be afraid. I am God. I am El Shaddai, the breasted one, the all-sufficient one. Now the Bible declares, without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is I remember I preached on that a few years ago in a series. And it doesn't only mean that he is, that he exists. It means that he is God. He is God. In other words, he is God. He is not a man, neither is he an angel, but he is God. When you understand that God is God, with whom nothing is impossible, for whom nothing is too difficult, with whom all things are possible. The God who said, let there be and there was. When you understand that he is God. God, the ruler, the creator. The one who subdues all things unto himself. Understand that the great I am. The mighty power upon the face of the earth. The God whose breath can destroy the earth in a whisker. The God whose word was so powerful that the world came into being and God said, let there be, and there was. Then you don't be afraid. You understand I am God. If I give you my word, I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. According to the book of Timothy, I have not given to the spirit of fear, but of power, hallelujah, and of love. And the strong mind, that's who I am. And we must understand that he is God. God. The great songwriter, what he said, God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the sea. And he rides upon the storm. Blind unbelief is shown to earth and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. Are you facing right now, beloved, a fearful situation? It might be something physical in your body. It might be something social. You're afraid to face the tomorrow. You're afraid to face the job market. You're afraid to face your creditors. You're afraid to face the bank. You're afraid even of all things to take the vaccine because you might die. You're afraid that this thing, the COVID-19, might invade your home in time. And fear is there, beloved. Fear thou not, for God is with you. He forms a barrier around the people. Psalm 46 says, The Lord God is our shield. He is our fortress. And he will be exalted upon the face of the earth. And we must understand that when you walk in the dark, you are not alone. When circumstances for you have got the answer surround you, you are not alone. And many times, beloved, we forget that and we go to the arm of flesh. That's why the people of Israel sang this song. Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. But we will believe the name of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. Yeah, he's stronger, beloved, than a host of chariots, a host of horses. He is stronger. And that is the God with whom um, you are living. That the God who has given you his word, that he will not leave you. He will not forsake you. 
The Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. The Lord is your shield. He's your buckler. He's your strong defense. He's your total solid rock on whom you can stand and you will not sink because you have put your trust in him. So as I close, let me remind you what I've done today. How can I be living above fear? One, I must understand the divine presence. Beloved, his presence is not once in a while. He is with you all the time. Fear thou not, for I am. Not I used to be, or I will be, but I am. At this present time, God is with you. And secondly, understand that he is God. He is whom? God. Think of God. Think of what God can do. Think of what God can do. There's nothing God can do. He is not a man. He is God. He is not an angel. He is God. Don't be afraid because I am God. And God will do just what God can do and what only God can do. And he will do it. May the Lord call something I've said today to resonate in your spirit and be a catalyst to make you go to a next level, destroying fear, walking even in the midst of hostile elements and just simply keeping your head high and your shoulder back because the greater one is with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the LaRose family right now for Sister LaRose, for Ivan, for Kevin, Tevon, and all the family members, and for Christiana, the wonderful wife of Keon. I pray the peace of God will fill their hearts even now. And Lord, I pray that this message will be used by the Holy Spirit to lift them up and to strengthen them. Keep your mighty hand upon them, I pray. Bless every family, bless every home, and let the peace of God that passes all understanding flood their soul, because where there's peace, there's no fear. I commit every person today into your hand, and I pray that your grace will prove to be more than enough. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Again, Sister Emily sent her greetings to you and all the girls up here doing quite well. Have a wonderful day and a fruitful, successful week. God bless you.